Hi, Roger. Hello. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, so, Roger, we were, we were talking a little bit uh, before the show started. Um, you've, you've just written this book about uh, experts. And can anyone become an expert? Well, that's an interesting point. I, I mean, it depends what you mean by become an expert. I think everybody is on the way to becoming expert in whatever they're doing, if they, if they really want to. And that's really what, what, the, what the essence of the book is, is that we, we, we sometimes think about experts as a, as a breed apart and people who are sort of recognised as an expert. And I think maybe that's, that's only one way of looking at it, because we are all becoming expert or becoming more expert in things that we really believe in and want to get better at. And so what I'm doing in the book is looking at what is that pathway, what is that journey that we are all on, whether we are becoming an international expert in something or whether we're just getting better at learning a language or playing a musical instrument or getting better at using technology or whatever it might be. Um, and I think, I think the idea that this is a process that takes a long time and it goes through stages uh, and you're not going to get there straight away, but if you persevere, you, you find it rewarding because you get much better at something that you believe in. I think that's a, a sort of central part of, of, of being human, really. You know, of wanting to do the best you can and, and, and get really good at something. And that's what this process is about. And how would you define expert? Because I almost feel like to different people, an expert would be different things. So, for example, my friends would see me an expert in tech. But then compared to the people that I watch and consume, I would say I know almost nothing compared to the level of some people. Yes, exactly. And I, mean, I think it depends on on who's who's trying to make that judgment. Um, as you mentioned in this book, I've I've drawn together conversations and, and collaborations I've had with loads and loads of experts, more than, more than 20 of them in the book, and almost all of them uh, wouldn't describe themselves as expert. They, they, all, um, they all say, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm trying to get better at it and, 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 and things, but I'm, I'm not really expert. And so, uh, but but to, to somebody outside, they are absolutely expert. And so I think this, this question of who makes those judgments is a very interesting one because very often it's a partly it's a social judgment and partly I think one of the unhelpful things is that people make judgments about the value of the work rather than the nature of becoming expert in it. And so, you know, uh, fighter pilots and neurosurgeons and concert pianists uh, are seen as being in a different category from heating engineers and plasterers and garage mechanics. But that's that's a that's a, a difference between the social value that we place on different occupations, not on what it is to be expert in those fields, because somebody can be equally expert as a plumber or a plasterer or a joiner, as they can as a um, as a as a pilot or a, a, a brain surgeon. I think, um, and it it can often muddy the waters when we when we mix up how people are viewed in society in terms of the value of the work that they do as opposed to their individual skills and what they've gone through to get there. Yeah, because I suppose like a pilot could probably couldn't plaster his house. Exactly. It's very often, I think. And one of the interesting things about ex is is it about becoming an expert is that you become expert in particular areas. You don't become an expert in everything. Um, you become expert in a particular area or areas that you've chosen to focus on and put a lot of effort and work into. At what stage do you actually become an expert? Is that something that you put on yourself? Is it as soon as other people put that onto you? Like, because obviously the experts that you've talked to wouldn't even count themselves as experts yet. They, they, no, very often they wouldn't count themselves as experts. Although, as I said, other people most assuredly would count them as experts. So there's something about your uh, your perception of your own uh, of where you've got to on that pathway. I mean, I think there are some, there are some sort of external um, criteria you you can use. If if somebody's been um, been working very hard to get better at something for years and years and years, and then they've gone through the stages that I outline in this book, which which usually ends up with them passing on what they've learned to other people, as a teacher or. Uh, or in an institution of learning or so something like that, then then you can, you know, there are certain markers where you can distinguish people who are just beginning from people who've 
who, who, who've learned a huge amount and become very skilled. It isn't quite as simple as it sounds because you can spend a lot of time trying to get good at something and not get very good at it. So it's not purely a question of saying, this person's been doing it for 20 years or 30 years, therefore they must be expert, because that doesn't necessarily follow. But I think knowing what we do about how long it takes to become expert in terms of the internal changes you have to go through as a person, I think you can fairly confidently say that to be truly expert, it's going to take you quite a long time. And I'm I'm talking about years rather than months or weeks. Um, but that that is, I think you have to judge each one on its own merits because you can have people who've, who've spent the same amount of time and yet they're not, they haven't got to the same place in terms of, of how expert they are as a, as a pilot or a plumber or whatever. And I think as like me and David have talked about previously, I think different, if you've learnt skills in other areas, then you could be- and you can become an expert in something else quicker than if you just started from zero. Yes, I'm sure that I'm sure that's true. I'm sure it helps. And when you look at people who've who've got sort of multiple strands in their in their lives or careers, very often those well, sometimes those feed into one another. I think, and um, I think these these processes that you go through on the way to becoming expert help explain some of the difficulties or the, the sort of transitions that you'll encounter even if you move to another area. I mean, traditionally, I think people have looked at becoming expert from the outside and they said, OK, you're a beginner and then you're an intermediate and then you get good at it. So traditionally, the sort of medieval guild uh, apprenticeship phase followed by being a journeyman where you go out into the outside world and you ply your trade or your craft and then you become a master and you have learners of your own. And that, that kind of gives a, a sense of progression but I think it's an oversimplification because actually what you really need to understand is what goes on inside you or me or, or people who go along that path. And uh, and that's not nearly as simple as that sort of clear logical progression makes it sound. Because sure enough, you, you, you do start not knowing anything and you've got to do a whole lot of stuff that people tell you to, whether you like it or not, or understand it or not. And that's just how it is. Um, but in that process, you're learning a whole lot of stuff. You're learning how to how to make sense of the materials you're working with. You're, uh, you're learning with other people. You're, you're navigating space. You're, you're doing all, all kinds of things are happening without you realizing it. And of course, you're making mistakes. But usually somebody else takes responsibility for those. And so you're kind of cushioned. But then in the next stage, you go out into the world as a as would have been called a journeyman. You're, 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 you're taking what you've learnt and you're doing it for real. And then I think two fascinating and really important things happen that are often not recognised. And the first one is you have to make a switch from thinking that it's all about you and the stuff that you've learnt and the exams that you've passed and the skills that you've gained and the things that you've spent all those years practising You've got to realise that nobody actually really you know, <laughs> care, cares much about, about that unless it actually works for someone else, unless it, it, it actually helps or, or is successful for your audience or your patients or your customers or your passengers or whoever it is that your work is for. And there's always somebody that your work is for, even if they're not there at the time and you can't see them, even if you're creating work that someone else will see or or buy or experience later. Nonetheless, you have to make that shift in focus and stop thinking it's all about you and think about who or why you're doing it. But at the same time, it is about you because as you become more experienced, it's about your individuality and your style and your voice. And so, you know, Adam and David, you're not just two faceless random ciphers doing a podcast. You are two individuals and you've got your individuality and you're bringing that together to make this a successful conversation. So it is about you, but on the other hand, it isn't only about you and it's not about you showing off. It's about the three of us having a conversation that will be of interest to listeners. Um, and so there's that there's that tension, and then and then in the third stage, when you when you become more experienced, you you then start, I think, to take responsibility for other people who are coming along in the path that you've gone on. Maybe you're you're contributing to not only to those individuals but to your field as a whole. 
you know, you might be working in a university or training setting or something like that, or you might even be taking your field in new directions altogether. You might be sort of breaking new ground. And and those things tend to happen when you're when you're at the sort of mastery stage. But I think the interesting thing about those procedures, those processes, is partly that people often don't recognise or acknowledge them. They don't see them happening while they're happening. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, along the way, you need to develop some pretty uh, highly developed ways of dealing with what happens that you can't predict. And so one of those things is when you get things wrong, and then when, once you're independent, you've got to put those right. It's no, no one else is going to dig you out of a hole. You've got to fix it very often. And the other one is you have to become pretty good at responding to the unexpected and improvising and and sort of reading the situation and doing something about it, bringing into play a whole lot of stuff that you've spent years learning, but you've never applied it in exactly that way because you've never been in that precise that precise situation before. And so all these things take years. And I think it's unrealistic to expect somebody, they may be very good at doing a particular part of the process, because you can get very good at doing something by working very hard for a short time. But what you can't get good at is this all round sense of putting it all together and and getting to the point of, of, of mastery. And I think it's when you get to that stage that you can, that we think of people as experts. But taking it back to the going from an apprentice to journeyman. I think that's an interesting stage because that's what I feel like a lot of our listeners will be in, where they're spending a lot of time learning and they haven't quite gone out into the world yet to actually sell that product and or whatever their service or skill or whatever it is they're doing. And I wonder what, like, at what phase you could kind of shift that because I almost feel like if you, because I think a lot of people will treat themselves as an apprentice for so long just feeling like they don't have the skills yet to actually go out there and become a journeyman, even though they might actually have them. I think that little balance between flipping from an apprentice to a journeyman is quite an important part of people's careers because it's quite like a mindset shift. Do you think to become an expert quicker, it would be better to make that transition into journeyman earlier? Well, I think there's a balance to strike because if you make it too early, you go out into the world so to speak, expecting to be able to, and other people as well, expecting you to be able to do stuff. And maybe you can't because you just haven't learnt what you need to learn. You haven't got to that stage yet. So there's a a balance. Obviously, if you keep people in the, if people stay in the apprenticeship stage for too long, they get stale, they don't really progress. And we used to see that, used to see that a lot, I think, you know, centuries ago where people would stay held back. And you see it still for far too long. On the other hand, if you go, if you get pushed out of the nest, you might say too quickly, then you're you're beyond your capacity to cope with it, and then you will almost inevitably make errors, which may have bad effects on other people, and certainly on yourself, might shiver your confidence, and then you've got a whole lot of making up to do. But I mean, I know, in, and, and sometimes that transition just happens because of the system you're in. So in my experience, I've got a medical background. And so I went through medical school and then I became a doctor. And once I became a doctor and had passed my exams, like it or not, I had stopped being a medical student and I was working on hospital wards as a junior doctor. Obviously, there was senior support, but nonetheless, I was doing things and taking responsibility for doing things, which I often didn't really feel that I had the experience to do. But I had to do them because that's where I was in the system and the system had kicked me out of the nest. Um, or at least it kick me into a different place. And I think sometimes there's a mismatch between where people have got to when that happens and the transition they're forced to make. Sometimes that's a bad thing because they just simply do not yet know enough to do the next phase. But sometimes it's a very good thing because they may think they can't do it, but actually when they're pushed into it, they find that they can. And, and, and that, again, is one of the ways I think people make leaps and they, they progress. Otherwise, it, it's quite possible to stay where you are, especially if you get comfortable there, for quite a long time uh, and, and sort of tread water. I think that was certainly mine and Adam's experience in business. I think that we, we probably went out before we were ready, but for us, the stakes are not 
as high as they are for for someone who's performing surgery. <laughs> if we do a bad painting, then we can paint over it and we can start again. So yeah, no, no, I, I know that. No, I've, I've done a lot of work with with magicians and uh, so, so certainly with magicians, but with musicians particularly, uh, and they. Often, when I start talking to them, they would say, oh, well, you know, but our world is so different. Nobody nobody dies if I play a wrong note. Uh, and, of course, in, in one sense, that's true. And from the point of view of the audience or the patient, that's absolutely true. But I think from the point of view of the person doing it, uh, I mean, I imagine that the stakes for you as a performer, if you give either a good performance or a bad performance on the Wigmore Hall or, or online or whatever it is, are not so very different from the stakes for you as a surgeon or a pilot or, or whatever. Because for you as a performer, it's all about doing the best you can. And if, if that hasn't happened for whatever reason, it, it can have a, a, a very damaging effect. If it goes well, it can have a very sort of enriching effect. And so I think this question of, 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 of what are the consequences of different kinds of work, again, it goes back to, uh, to whether the focus is on, is on who's receiving whatever it is, and on who's presenting it or creating it. And I, I think there's much more in common than we might think between different kinds of people as they become expert in terms of these internal processes, and particularly this one of confidence and balancing the need to be pushed with the need not to be pushed too far too soon. Yeah, I think confidence is so it is such an interesting subject because as I was reading the book, I was going on a roller coaster ride of yeah, I'm definitely an expert. Oh, no, I'm not an expert. And <laughs> I, I, I was analyzing myself the whole time going, yes, you are. No, you're not. And I, I didn't get to apprentice. I just started painting as a teenager, painting on the streets. And that, that I learned all of my own mistakes. And I suppose, so our company, we have the only, the world's only um, graffiti apprenticeship that's that's kind of official. Um, and so, and we've had three apprentices so far. And it's, it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting process because you see what you do in such a different way when someone comes to you from no experience. We, we normally take on people who have an experience of painting, but not necessarily using a spray can. And so, so we don't have to teach them how to draw, uh, but we, we teach them how to use the instruments. And there's things that, that just become second nature that you don't think about, that you don't analyze as you make a painting, that to someone who's never used a spray can before is, is completely alien. And so when it comes to actually teaching those things, for, for a lot of it is, is just like, okay, start painting and then things will present themselves and then we can address them as they come up rather than us giving you this huge long list of, of topics that you're going to cover. And it seems that the confidence is just this gradual, these gradual steps on the ladder. And I think when you are in an apprenticeship scheme, you have the affirmation of a teacher that can say, yes, that's correct. You've done the right thing there. Um, whereas when you're, when you are self-taught for me, it was very different. I didn't ever have anyone going, you've, you've made the right decision. And I think the, the only reason that I carried on painting was because I enjoyed the experience of painting as opposed to, I felt like I was achieving and getting better. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. And, and there's, there's an interesting thing there too, isn't, isn't there, David, about, about the things that you don't know you don't know. And you, you're talking about these, you know, the, <clears throat> the people with the spray cans and things and stuff that's to you now completely second nature that they don't think of. And I mean, I certainly encountered this in a, in a surgical way when I started teaching people a lot about how to do, uh, in this case, it was teaching GPs how to do relatively, well, minor Operation minor surgery, it was called. Uh, that word minor surgery is a sort of freighted word, isn't it? Because it depends on what you consider to be uh, minor. And that was a very interesting issue because at that stage, which was in the 1980s, GPs who, uh, the, the, the government, the rules changed and GPs started to be uh, rewarded for doing minor procedures in their in their surgeries, in their, their consulting rooms. And so, of course, they they started to do them. But a lot of the GPs had never really liked surgery. That's one of the reasons why they went into general practice rather than surgery. Um, and often they'd been made to feel rather small and useless uh, on the, uh, when they did go into the operating theatre as medical students. So 
when this idea of minor surgery came up, it was it was it it was taught by very experienced surgeons, consultant surgeons, who saw operations, procedures of this kind as really very, very minor, the sort of thing that they never did anymore because their juniors did them. Uh, and so they would teach in a way that at first I couldn't quite understand what the problem was, but the problem was that there that between very experienced people and very inexperienced people is a whole lot of stuff that the experienced people for the experienced people, it has become so much second nature that they no longer recognize it's a thing. And for the inexperienced people, they're so inexperienced that they don't even realize it's a thing, but for a different reason. And so, for instance, handling instruments and recognizing what different, which instruments to, to, to use for what, which, David, I think is a, probably a bit like your, your spray can example. You know, if you, if it, if you, you don't know the difference between this instrument and that instrument, they look a bit similar, but they work in a different way, it's very easy to use the wrong one. And then everybody shouts at you because you can't do the work properly. But if no one's ever told you that those instruments are different and why, how can you know? But once you've been doing it for 20 or 30 years, you completely forget that there was ever a time when you didn't know that stuff. And so you don't think to explain it. And so there's a kind of, there's a kind of intermediate zone where I think... We need to be really careful to make sure that people do understand. I was talking to somebody last week who who was a self-taught wood engraver. Um, and it, he, he, he's been doing it for a number of years. He's actually an academic. He's, he's got a completely different day job. But he's a very gifted wood engraver. And now he started teaching. And he said it wasn't until um, he'd been doing this for about, 10 years, you know, with wood engraving, you, you, you take a very, very smooth, flat piece of wood and you inside, you cut lines into it, very delicate lines, and then you ink it and then you print it. Um, and for a long time, he struggled in recognising exactly where he'd made those lines because they were very difficult to see. After a long, long time, the penny dropped that all he had to do was cover the surface of the wood with ink to begin with and black ink. And then whenever he made a line into the wood, he would see it. Um, now, all professionally trained wood engravers learn that in their apprenticeship workshop on day one. But because he was self-taught, he said the penny just hadn't dropped. He hadn't made the connection <laughs> that there was a simple solution to a problem that he hadn't at the time even recognised as a problem. He hadn't formulated this as a problem. But then when he started teaching other people, he was able to say, well, the first thing you need to do, obviously, is to make sure that you know where you've cut. And you do that by putting ink on the surface and then the lines that you cut will look white. Um, and so there are there are these things that are nothing to do with intelligence or or anything else. They, they are simply that there is a body of knowledge that is largely unarticulated, that, that, that unless people explain it to you, you don't instinctively know and you have to spend ages before you find out. And I, I think that what you were saying with the spray cans might be rather similar in that there's stuff that you know as an experienced artist that that's become internalised. And it's very difficult to put yourself back into the position of somebody who's never not known that. I mean, who's, <laughs> you know, who's always not known it, who's never known it, if you see what I mean, because you, 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 you can't unpick where you've got to in your journey to being expert because it becomes sort of internalised and, and, and sort of all part of it. And I think that's one of the issues. I suppose one thing that's interesting that we do is the fact that we teach people, we do graffiti workshops. So people who've never used a spray can before, we often teach them. So we're always going back to those really early things. But then, for example, there'll be other things that we don't teach. For example, I, was, I do some like 3D design, well, learned at uni and stuff. And I was trying to explain to someone the other day when we were talking about a concept that Pixar designed. Uh, and what made them quite revolutionary and i was like oh i i don't know how to explain this to you because you don't know any of the steps before so and then i was kind of like stuck of like how do i explain this because actually i know so many different things that you need to know before you can understand this that it's i actually can't think back to how to explain it in a like a logical way yeah, I think it's exactly that. It's exactly that. And in this book, I, I, I use a, a metaphor I, I came up with when I went to a, um, you know, the big National Trust for Stately Homes, where in the 18th century, you'd have a big stately home and then there'd be a big garden around it. Uh, and then there'd be a park. 
um, with with deer and, and 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 things. And if you were sitting in your stately home in the 18th century, having a meal at breakfast time, you would you would see the deer coming up right to the edge of the flower beds, but they never actually eat the flowers. And it wasn't obvious why they didn't eat the flowers, because, you know, why didn't they just come in and eat them? And actually, the reason was that there's a great big ditch called a ha-ha yeah. that goes all the way around between the garden and the park, which is a, it's a very steep vertical face at the, the, the nearest bit to the house. And then, there's a, and then there's a sort of slope upwards, so that when you look out from the house to the park, you can't see it. it's completely invisible. But when you look in the other direction, from the park towards the house, there's this unclimbable wall, this ditch that you just simply can't get over. And I think that's really interesting because it, to me, it summarises the fact that if you're in one place looking in one direction, you see something that is completely invisible if you're on the other side looking in the other direction. So people in the house or teachers or people like you just can't understand why the learners just don't come along and, and do the same as you're doing. Why not? And of course, the reason why not is that there's this huge gap of stuff that you can do and they can't. And they can see the gap, but you're not aware of it. And I think that that, that effect, I think we see it in, in all kinds of areas. You see it in medicine, you see it in, in the performing arts, you see it in, in, in the arts, you see it in, in all sorts of areas. And it's quite a difficult one to get over because once you've got into the house and you no longer see the ha-ha, you actually have to make an effort to place yourself in that other position and once again let it come into view. And I don't, I don't know whether you notice that with the computing particularly, because I guess you must have an awful lot of sort of ways of thinking and doing things that newcomers haven't yet gained. I think it's interesting, Adam, when you think about when you and I met, I'd been painting for 10 years at that point, and Adam came to it as a complete novice who had not painted before, but had lots of art skills. And then started teaching me techniques as I was teaching him how to paint. He started teaching me stuff that I had never considered, never thought of, but coming at it from not an expert, which is really interesting. And the other thing that Adam would do that I didn't do, I, I guess because I was too close to it or I was too uh, naive or foolish, was that Adam started looking at, Adam was like, okay, well, I want to get really good at this. So I started looking at various different painters watching youtube videos and then incorporating techniques that they were using that i wasn't teaching him and which raised my painting and raised his painting yeah and i, I think that's really interesting that it's 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 easy to oversimplify this business of becoming expert but i think actually all of us are at different stages along this path in the various different aspects of our of our lives. And so we may be, you know, quite far towards becoming a master even in, in one area, but just beginning or, or still struggling with, with other things. And and then and then having you, you know conversations or, or or collaborations like the one you've just described um, can can sort of give you insights into what's going on at the earlier stages of a path you've already moved on along, if that makes sense. But I do think you have to be a bit open-minded because when you're, or at least you have to keep your antennae waving because when you're at the early stages and you're struggling to use a, a, a spray paint can or, or, or I guess do some coating or, or, or certainly t tie knots or put up drips on people in, in my case, that sort of thing, your, your attentional capacity is pretty much all used up in trying to do that. And then gradually, as you get better, you, you, it becomes more second nature and you can, you can do those things without thinking about them so much. And so you can do other things with that freed up attentional capacity. But, but when people are just beginning and they're really struggling, I think it's, unreal, it's unrealistic to expect them to be able to have the same kind of all-round view that you've got as a, as a, as a, as a more expert person, because it, you, you know, it, it just takes so much effort to do the things that you're struggling with to learn to do when you're early on. Yeah, I think it kind of goes back to what you talked about with the wood block earlier, with the fact that like, I feel like if I want to learn something quickly and get really good quick, there's a balance of like, I can explore and try everything myself, but the fact that someone has most definitely done this before. And so what I always try and do is, okay, like, well, who's the best at this in the world? And then just observe and just like, absorb and try and analyze every little technique and thing that they're doing. And then like then employ that myself in practice and I think there's definitely that balance between just like because there'll be people who want to learn something and they'll spend 
10 years just watching YouTube videos and never actually getting hands-on practical experience and then they'll never actually really get better but I think understanding when that balance between when is the time to okay well I've got this knowledge now I need to put that into practice and then that fine balance between always educating yourself but always actually putting things into action as well well I think I think that's the that's what I was saying really about this sort of transition between the apprenticeship and the journeyman stage where where somebody needs to push you off the diving board really or or, or you need to push yourself off the diving board at some stage and go out there and actually do it take responsibility for how it goes and fix it when it goes wrong Uh, because you can spend ages and ages and ages just trying to get better and better at something before making that transition and I think we notice that a lot a a, a lot of the um, people I well I've spent a lot of time in the last few years really with magicians close-up magicians um, particularly, and they, I found those conversations fascinating because they, they, they draw a distinction between the, the sort of manual side. I mean, this is people who do extraordinary things with cards and coins and stuff. And one of them was, 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 was talking about how he learnt, as opposed to how people learn now. And very often, when people are learning magic, they're using YouTube videos, um, and you can become extremely good. At, at doing the manipulative side by watching YouTube videos. And this magician, Richard McDougall, talks about magic has never been better than it is now from the elbows down, as he calls it. So that's the what people do with their hands and how they make things disappear. What, what, what has never been worse in, in many cases, though, is what happens from the elbows up, namely how they perform, how they engage with an audience, how they capture people's attention, how they establish that sense of, of, of it being an exciting thing for somebody to be involved in, how they give people that sense that something impossible is going to happen and it can't happen because it's impossible, but it just has, um, you know, all, all that side, which is the essence of being a magician rather than just being able to do dexterous things. And and so I think there's something about that putting it into practice, which is learning to make it work for a live audience uh, and also learning how to deal with the things you, that YouTube videos can't tell you, you know, how to deal with hecklers or what happens when you drop your cards or what happens when things go wrong or, or things go right. Or you, you, you know, none of that really comes over by looking at somebody else's vicarious experience, however helpful that may be in mastering specific technique uh, and you can say that mastering the technique is part of the stage, one of the stages you need to go through. But what I mean by being an internal process is you have to understand what it is to put that into, uh, put that all together and then perform in a way that makes sense for other people. And I think that's what we've been talking about from our different perspectives just now, I think. If everyone is on this spectrum of becoming expert, but we have things like the YouTube videos and stuff. Do you, would you say that experts are perhaps an endangered species? No, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think I think experts are being undervalued. Uh, I mean, I think experts now are as essential as they always have been, more so, if anything. Um, I think I think it's important to distinguish between having expertise and becoming expert. Um, and I think it's I think it's possible to look at, at, at isolated elements of expertise. It might be the ability to do something on a machine, or 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 to to play this or that on a musical instrument, or do a card trick, or or or, or, or a particular approach to painting, say. But those those are those are elements of a much bigger process. And what I'm talking about is is an internal process of becoming, of changing and turning into a a becoming expert, even if not an expert, but becoming expert. And it sounds like a subtle distinction, but I think it's very important because a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of the focus these days is about things that provide elements of expertise. And the idea that you can do everything more quickly and more cheaply and, you, you know, and it's all about assessment of component parts, I think can be very dangerous because it takes away our understanding of the need for that long, slow process of development and maturation that 
that, that ends up by giving you not only skill, but wisdom. And it's the wisdom that we really need in how to make sense of what's going on, how to respond to situations, how to work with other people. And, and that's a very human thing. It's not just a collection of isolated kinds of expertise that you can stitch together and you become an expert. It's much more than that. It's the sum is more than the, uh, you know, the whole is more than the sum of its parts argument. Uh, but people often, they often, I think, miss that and they they reduce being expert to these these measurable, assessable elements. And so that can lead to the value, uh, to experts being undervalued. Uh, and, and people say, oh, yeah, but anyone can do that. I mean, you know, all you did, um, whereas actually what you miss then is the internal processes of those 10, 15, 20, 30 years that people have gone through in order to get to the stage of being able to make sensible judgments or give good advice or, or give a very simplified performance that appears very simple, but is actually only looks simple because of all the work that's gone into it. And David, I'm sure you must get this with, with the world of painting, you know, where where sometimes things look beautifully simple, but actually they represent many, many years of, of, of thought and hard work in order to get there and it's, i think it's the same in any field yeah absolutely it's it's so funny that it, me, me and adam have said on the podcast before like if we were to write a book it would be the worst selling book of all time because our headline would not be the four hour work week or the or the the 60 second millionaire it would be the the 15 year slog and <laughs> no, to hear that people people want the the quick the quick fix to getting there straight away and it, it just doesn't happen overnight well I hope, I hope that doesn't mean that my book's going to be the worst selling book of all time <laughs> <laughs> because that is exactly the argument i'm making really is that this is a slow burning fuse and and that if we try i mean obviously some things can be done you you, you may not need to, to to spend 35 years in learning to do whatever it is you may be able to do it in 30 years or whatever who, who knows exactly and, and that's kind of negotiable wh where that line is but you can definitely say that you can't learn whatever it is in six months there comes a point where when you when you try and condense and squeeze things too much it breaks and i think a lot of what we're seeing at the moment is a, a, a sort of relentless pressure to do things more quickly, more cheaply, uh, in a shorter time with fewer resources uh, and not allowing people time to, uh, to gradually develop these ways of, of, of thinking and, and talking and engaging with the world and with other people that actually just take a load of time. And there's just no way around it. You just have to put in that time. Yeah, that's really interesting because I feel like with... I think technology is obviously massively affecting the way people perceive things. And because technology is getting quicker and allows and allowing us to do things quicker and everything is just like, you want something, if I want some food, I could go on my phone and it'd be here in like 10 minutes. Whereas actually, yeah, to learn a skill, we're so used to not have, needing patience because everything just comes to us whenever we need it, that as soon as it comes to like learning something, we want the same effect because we're used to that. We're used to just, well, I like that, so I'm going to get it and it's going to be here first thing tomorrow morning. Whereas, yeah, to learn a skill, it's going to take a long time. And I think that card that card analogy is perfect because it's like, yes, I could learn to do some sleight of hand quickly, probably by the end of the week by watching YouTube videos, but I'm not going to learn the rapport needed to actually go and do that as a profession for a long time. That's going to take a lot of going out there, putting yourself in uncomfortable situations so you grow and become like a stronger person like inside as well as just the technical skills that you have. Yeah, that's exactly what I mean. And I, and I, mean, I should say that this is not, not in any way an anti-technology argument, because I think that, you know, technology, I mean, you, you know, without, without spray cans, you wouldn't be able to do the work that you're doing in that way. Uh, without, without uh, you know, a computer, I wouldn't have been able to write the book I've written. Without, without all this technology, we wouldn't be able to do any of the stuff that we're doing at the moment. And it's, it's, it's great where it's, where it's needed. Well, I think the, the mistake can come in thinking that we can, that instead of using that as part of becoming expert, we can use that instead of becoming expert. And I think that we need to be very careful about conflating those two things, because, um, you, you, you know, word processing, for example, allows us to do all kinds of things that would have been impossible 20 or 30 years ago. Um, but it still doesn't 
take away the need to be able to think clearly, write clearly, spend a load of time getting rid of unnecessary sentences and, 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 and really making sure that what you want to say is exactly what you want to say. And that is not a function of technology. Technology allows you to manage the process and, and to streamline things enormously. And it's invaluable and I'm all for it. But it still doesn't take away the fact that what the technology is allowing you to do is a human thing, which in this case is communication. Um, or it might be performance or whatever. And those are the things, those human things, are the things that require a developmental process and time and the conditions for those transformations, those transitions to happen. You know, a supportive environment, people who will understand when you make mistakes and help you put them right rather than pillorying you. Um, you know, an environment that allows you to do things like, the, the, like when you two went into business and take those risks and you know all those things, and then later on to to think about the responsibilities that you have not only to the work that you're doing but to the people you're working with, um, all those things, and they all need to happen together. And so I think that the uh, the arguments you often hear about about the dangers of technologies, I think they 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 are the wrong arguments very often because technology itself is is essential and and very exciting and opens up all kinds of new possibilities. But it is not a substitute for this process of human people becoming expert, which has always been there and I think always will, and is now more important than ever, partly because we need experts for the things that they can do and we can't, like when we're ill, Um, but partly because we're all of us becoming expert because that's what it is to be human, is to get better at something we want to get better at and to put our energies into something that is leading somewhere, I think. And that's why becoming becoming expert, as opposed to being expert or being an expert, but b- becoming expert is a part of everyone's experience. Technology almost moves the bar of what an expert is, because if you, like, if you compared yourself to a doctor from 200 years ago, you would look at what they were doing and be like, they, are not, they do not know what they're doing at all, yet they were seen as an expert at the time. Whereas technology, technology and knowledge has evolved so much since then, that now the threshold for what an expert is obviously much higher because you wouldn't let a doctor from 200 years ago operate in a current day hospital. So, certainly not. I mean, it's, you see it everywhere, don't you, that, you know, the four minute mile, whenever it was in the 1950s, had only ever been done by one people. And now that's the sort of thing that people do fairly early on in their career. You know, those pieces of music that were completely unattainable to anybody except Chopin or Liszt or something are now done by people going into, played by people going into music conservatoires at the age of 18. You know, all, all these things are changing. Um, and so uh, and, and so where you are at a particular moment, I think really depends on, 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 on how far those things have developed, which is why it's useful to look at becoming expert as a, as a more fundamental process that isn't that's always there, even though its manifestations are, are different according to the cumulative knowledge of your field. You were talking about the surgeons of 200 years ago, the technology, all these things. And I think if we're to remain, I mean, in my own field of, of medicine, particularly surgical education, there's so much happening all around with new technologies and robots and artificial intelligence and machine learning and you know all, all manner of things, all the genetic stuff. Um, the landscape is completely unrecognisable from when I was a medical student. But the process of becoming, uh, of, of re- remaining uh, sort of au fait with those things that relate to your field, but still retaining the humanity to, to work with patients, to, to work out with them what needs to be done, come up with sensible solutions and then, and then do them. That hasn't changed or shouldn't. And that's what I mean by being a human thing, because the, the the environment changes and the opportunities and the technology, of course, keep changing. But the 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 internal process, I think, remains recognisably the same. It would appear that people who become expert have a high tolerance for boredom. Do you have any advice to um, cracking through the boredom stage? Well, yeah, they have they have to put up with boredom for a long time. Um, in the book, I, I give an example of a, um, a bespoke tailor I've been working with for a long, long time, for over 10 years now, Joshua Byrne, who's 
It's very interesting. You might at first think that tailors and surgeons would have very much in common, apart from perhaps needle and thread work. But it turns out that they that they do. And and I, so I've been working with Joshua for uh, a long time, and 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 with him tracking these stages of becoming expert. And and he talked about when he first started to become a tailor. He, he suddenly had a moment when he realised that that's what he wanted to do. So he left university where he was studying at the time and became an apprentice jacket maker. And for months and months and months, he was just sitting there in his master's workshop making pocket flaps. That's, that was his example that stuck in his mind uh, for jackets, you know, the flap that goes over, which actually is much more complicated than you might at first think because it has to be exactly shaped so that it it fits with the jacket and it doesn't gape open or or, or, or whatever. Quite difficult. Uh, and he he would just make these time and time and again and then his master would come and just look over his shoulder and say, no, no, <laughs> no good. And so he'd have to do it again. He, he, he didn't say why it wasn't any good, but he just said it wasn't any good. So Joshua ended up doing this again and again and again. And first of all, he almost went mad with boredom because he, he couldn't understand what was going wrong, bloody pocket flaps again and again. But then he, he said he realised that, that either he could just put up with this being incredibly boring, think about something else and just carry on doing it, or he could find a way to make that work interesting. And so he deliberately reframed that task. So he used each one as an opportunity to try and make one little thing better in terms of his technique. And so he changed his attentional focus from the pocket flaps being a distraction to what he really wanted to do, which was to make whole jackets and things. Yes, to, to focus on that task, do the best he could with what he had at the time and, and make what he had seen boring become interesting by focusing on, on it as an opportunity for him to improve his skills. And I thought that was very interesting because it was a, it was a moment when he recognised that he had a choice. He could either go on getting really bored or he could do something about it. And so I think, although you're right, you do have to have the capacity to do to soak up loads of, loads of work that's boring at the time. And you can't make every boring task seem interesting, even if you try. <laughs> Nevertheless, there are ways. If, if you recognise that that is a, 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 an unavoidable but still temporary part of the process that you've committed to in wanting to get good at something, then I think that helps you in just knuckling down. I think it's like practicing scales on the piano. I mean, you know you're never going to become a concert pianist unless you do it. And you don't particularly want to spend hours practicing the scale of B flat minor in contrary motion or whatever it is, but you just have to do it because that's required. And you, you're not doing it because your intention is to perform scales. You're doing it because it's a means towards something else. And so you have to kind of, I think, recognise that becoming expert involves a lot of that kind of work, especially at the beginning. Um, so to go back to your question, yeah, I think, I think the question of, of what is your boredom threshold is something that you can, that you can have an effect on. It, it's, not, it's not something you're born with and you're, 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 you're stuck with. I think you can reframe your boredom thresholds and and maybe turn them into something else. I suppose like almost looking at things and being like, why am I doing this? Yes, it might be really boring, but then thinking like why? So for example, like doing the scales, then muscle memory might come into that by doing those so many times. Yeah. If you understand that I have to do this a thousand times so I get the muscle memory to in, to in order to do it. For example, like I used to play basketball and like the amount of times I would just stand in my driveway, shooting the same basket from the same place over and over again. Because then you'd start to build that muscle memory. And then when you're playing in a game, I didn't even have to think about getting my arms in the right position and doing the right things because it would just happen naturally. Yeah, I think it's exactly that. Uh, but there's no shortcut to that. I mean, you, you can't suddenly come in and sort of spend 10 minutes. You, you, you may understand the principle of how you need to throw the ball so that it goes through the basket and things. But that doesn't really help you being able to do it in the moment without thinking about it, which is exactly what you were saying, Adam. And I think that there's something about recognizing or you may not even recognizing at the time but the system that you're in recognizing that you have to spend that time i've called it doing time in the book you've just got to you, you know there's no shortcut if you don't do it you haven't got the skills you need to paint to put basketballs in the net to drive 
whatever it is that you're trying to do, you just haven't got them yet because they need to become automatic. Um, and I think that takes quite a long time. And I think it's very easy to to think that because it's boring, it would be good not to have to do it. And from a short-term point of view, when you're there at the time, that makes a lot of sense because it is boring and you don't want to do it. But actually, that's a false economy because if you go on to the next stage without having really mastered that, you come unstuck and then you're likely to make mistakes or hurt people or let the team down or not do the best painting you could or your business goes under or any of those things because you haven't laid the foundations. For me, it, it, as I'm painting, I feel like, because I'm never happy or satisfied with any painting that I make pretty much, and I just see it as this is another step on the journey for me to get where I want to get to, but then understanding, and especially came across through reading the book, understanding that I will actually never get there. I, th- I think that's really important. I mean, I was thinking about this when I was writing this book, you know, because it's the first book of this kind I've ever written, you know, for a general audience uh and i didn't know when it was finished really um you know because i got all this stuff i wanted to say uh, uh one level i wanted to put all that stuff in and another level I, I needed to pare it down to just say the minimum it needed in order to make the points i wanted to make but there were there are lots of other things i wanted to say. and at some stage i had to take a decision to to sort of stop it and and submit the manuscript and move on to something else because otherwise you could go on forever. And I think David, that's what you, you know, you could do that with a painting, couldn't you? Lots of the painters I've talked to say the similar sort of thing. They they don't quite know when to, or it's a difficult decision when to stop. I suppose with the book as well, it's like, who is the audience there? Because if your audience is a 15 year old person, then that's going to be a very different level of getting to an expert compared to someone who is 60 and has been doing for the past 45 years, they've been doing this skill. Exactly. And so, I mean, these are judgments. And, and I mean, in a way, if it's a live performance, you, you've got a bit of a sense of who's there and how you're going down at the time. But writing a book is, is <clears throat> it's an asynchronous performance, isn't it? You write it, much later on, other people read it. Yeah. So it's, it's not like you're giving a concert or, or a magic trick or even doing an operation. It's, it's, it's a different thing. And so there's a, there's a gap between what you've done and the decisions that you made in terms of when it's finished and, and, and how it, and then how it's received six months or a year or, or many years later. Um, and I don't know yet because it's, it's only coming out at the end of this month on the 27th of August. Um, so I have to wait and see how, how, how that part of it goes. But I think the, the decisions that you go through when you're deciding when your work is fit to be seen, uh, knowing that it will never be as good as it could ever be. Mm. But equally, that you have at some stage have to take the decision to separate from it and to send it out to a wider uh, constitu- to a, a wider audience, if you'd like to call it that. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a judgment call, I suppose, isn't it? And, and who knows? I mean, it must be like that with, with starting up a business, isn't it? When you, you, know, you don't know whether it's going to work, you don't know... It, but you've got to take risks and make decisions based on, I, I imagine, I mean, I've never set up a business like that, but, but based on your, your reading of the situation at the time. Yeah, so completely in some of your audience, because if we wanted to release art courses, we would have to decide who are we appealing to? Are we appealing to people who have spent the however many years learning a craft and just need to learn how to use a can? Or are we teaching people who a stick man is all they would say they could draw? Yeah, exactly. And And I mean, there might be, there might be people at all kinds of different levels who would be interested in what you're offering, but they would get different things out of it, presumably. One of the most incredible people that we've interviewed on this podcast is a guy called Laird Hamilton, who is a, well, like probably the most famous surfer in the world. And he, one of the questions I had from, from him, which he didn't really answer, but um, I, I said, sort of, you, you've come to like the top of your field, you're the most famous surfer in the world, but then he continued to innovate and for him it was always riding bigger and bigger waves that was that was his thing and so he started doing things like like there's now this technique where you get a boat to drive you into the wave and it kind of flicks them in um and that and he's he's invented these um surfing techniques of like he he straps snowboard boots onto his surfboard like all of these wacky things to go to go higher and higher um 
what what is it like where does um innovation come from because i feel like most people once they get to the pinnacle they kind of stop but there are there are a lot of people that that sort of push past those boundaries as well um where do you think that that sort of drive to continue innovating comes from i suppose it's, a, it's quite a human thing i suppose i think it's exactly that i think it's a human thing i mean one of the one of the most striking examples i've encountered I put into the book as well. He was a, a, a colleague of mine who, who sadly died several years ago at the age of almost 90, um, John Wickham, who was a, a, a pioneer of keyhole surgery. And I spent a lot of time talking to him and 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 his colleagues about, about what was going on at that time in the late 1980s or thereabouts. So John Wickham had, uh, he trained as a surgeon, he became a urologist dealing with kidneys and bladders and things like that, particularly kidney stones, and he became a consultant surgeon. And, and many people, most people perhaps, once they got there, would see that as the, as the pinnacle of their career. They'd been working for, towards it, became a consultant in central London, big teaching hospital. But, but he didn't. He'd always felt that there was something not right about having to make a huge incision in somebody's side, um, an incision the, the length of a runner bean, to, to take out a stone that was the size of a lentil, as he put it. So he felt this was the wrong way around um, and that there must be a better way. And so always he was sort of pushed by this idea that, there, that it might be possible to to think of surgery in a completely different way from the traditional. You, you, Adam, you were talking about surgery from 200, 300 years ago. And I mean, until then, it, 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 the general sense was that if you, if you wanted to, to get a good view, you need to make a big incision in somebody, open them up, then you could see where all the organs were and, and you could do what you needed to do. But he completely changed that. There were other colleagues, of course, who were working along the same lines, but he was a, he was a real pioneer because he had this vision that it might be possible to do surgery in a completely different way. So he came up with um, these ideas of, of working with uh, colleagues, in particular a colleague from interventional radiology, so an x-ray specialist, to put in tiny wires through the skin into exactly the right place on somebody's kidney or ureter where the stone was, and then slide a, a, a little tube and then a slightly bigger tube and then a bigger tube down there and then eventually have a hole that was channel that was big enough to, to slide a narrow instrument with a sort of grasping um, thing at the end to pick up the stone and pull it out without making a big hole. Um, and, and this was a time when there was a lot going on in the world of technology. In the 1980s, there were new approaches to, 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 to imaging, you know, to CT scans and ultrasound. And then there were new energy sources. There were lasers. There were, um, there, there were all kinds of uh, things. There was fiber optics. It, it happened to be the right time in terms of what was going on on the technology front. And he brought this vision of a different kind of surgery and got the right group of people to work with him to really revolutionize and bring in something that that turned into keyhole surgery as we know it now and so if you have your gallbladder taken out or most many many operations these days you will go into hospital you'll have a tiny little incision you'll probably be out and home the next day um, whereas 30 years ago you would go into hospital for a kidney operation you'll be in hospital for two or three weeks you'll be off work for up to three months and, and this has radically changed the whole landscape. But when you trace it back, you find that there are one or two pioneers like John Wickham, who from the outset had a vision that the whole professional world they were in could be changed. And I don't think that that's, that wouldn't just have happened if you put together uh, lasers, fiber optics, CT scans, ultrasound. It needed a person with a particular kind of vision to make all those things gel and to take their field in a different direction. And it really has been completely revolutionary. Most surgery now is unrecognizable for people um, of, that, of that early way of doing things. And that was largely driven by the, by the vision of a small number of people of whom John Wickham was one. And, and tr tracking that process was very interesting because it turned out, to go back to your, to your question, David, that he had always felt that 
there was more to surgery than simply carrying out the procedures that had been de designed by other people in the way that they had done them and doing that for, the, for his career. Valuable though that is, he felt that there was more. And I thought that was a really interesting way of looking at things because that was a restless uh, desire to become expert in a different way. And it, it parallels Laird's story so much as well because he he did the same thing he got a team in and he used like jet skis and things like that so and he was consulting other experts and then got other surfers in and and it was a team effort to make to make these innovations so um so yeah it, it does it does feel like everything is in for like you do need to be open and listening to other sources that because I, I mean you you talk in the book about about you wished that earlier in your career you'd realized that you could learn from a from a tailor or a musician and i i think that we i suppose it's the goal of this podcast is to collate all of those different stories from a vast array of different places because you can always gain something from someone else's story. Yeah, I think that's right. I mean, the thing that was come, came over to me most powerfully, I suppose, in thinking back over all this stuff when I was writing this book last year, is that there's a huge amount that you can learn from people who are experts in other areas, but you don't normally think mm. to do that. And yet people are all around you, all around us, if we, if we only think to look. And so, you know, every time somebody comes and, 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 and you know, you've got a blocked up drain or, or, you, or somebody comes perhaps do some plastering in your house or something like that, or you go to a concert, you know, if you just think, well, what, what, what is it that those people are doing? How, how might they have got there? And, and how could the things that they, are, um, that they are expert at, how could that relate to what you're interested in? So the, a penny dropped with me with the, another magician when I, he was explaining, he's another close-up magician, Will Houston, very expert, about um, parallels between a close-up magic performance and a clinical consultation. Because at the, from, from one point of view, what could be further apart than magic tricks with cards and, uh, and a consultation with somebody who might have pneumonia, say? Completely different. But when you think about it, if you think about not the content, but the process, and you realize that both of those are a close-up live performance with a very small audience of maybe just one, your patient, in a clinical sense. There are very similar things because you go through stages. First of all, you have to connect with the, with the person you're with. You have to establish a rapport. You have to be able to shape their attention. Then you have to, um, you, you have to reach a joint understanding of what it's all about, whether it's a magic trick or whether it's a, a, a diagnosis, then you have to make sure that what you want to land has landed, that they've understood or taken it or experienced the magic trick or the or the consultation. Then you have to make sure that you know what to do if things go wrong. Uh, you have to think ahead. And then finally, you have to look after your own the effect on you, you know, if you if it's gone badly, you don't want it to screw up your next performance. If it's gone well, you you, you know, the, and, and if you look at if you look at that, you see that there are very powerful similarities. So the magician is extremely good at making connections with people, able to shape their attention where he wants them, so that in his case, so that he can do things where they're not attending very often, um, and he wants them to go away with a. Uh, an impression, a memory of what happened that was positive. He wants them to go away with an impression of what happened that wasn't actually what did happen in the case of magic. Um, and he wants people to tell other people, he wants them to tell other people about it. So he's deliberately constructing in their minds a recollection of what happened. And I think it's like that in medicine where you want somebody after a consultation to go away with a sense that, that the consultation has been in some way helpful. Uh, it, it won't be enjoyable because it's not a magic show you've paid to go to and you may be seriously ill. But nonetheless, you want to feel that things have moved on and that there is a relationship of care between those two people. Uh, and then finally, you need to make sure that, you know, if, if it's not what you think it is, you've got safety plans in place and, you know, if, if you, you need to look after your own state of mind as well. So there are these very strong parallels. And yet most most doctors don't have the opportunity to talk to close-up magicians and vice versa about the work that they do. And it requires a bit of effort in making those connections and then going and seeking them out. Uh, but if you do, you find that they can be 
immensely, not only interesting, but, but also, I think, really helpful in turning the spotlight back on what you thought you knew and, and seeing different things that were there all the time, but you didn't notice. Absolutely. Uh, what a fantastic, uh, fascinating conversation. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, well, where can our listeners find and uh, connect with you online? Uh, well, they can connect with me online um, through my email. At, uh, I, I work at Imperial College London, one of the big London universities. Uh, and my email there is r.nebone, that's K-N-W-E-B-O-N-E, at imperial.ac.uk. Um, my book, Expert Understanding the Path to Mastery, is being published by Penguin Books on the 27th of August. Uh, and it will also have an audio book equivalent and be available on Kindle for people who prefer that. Um, I also uh, have a podcast of my own called Countercurrent, which I've been uh, running for about five or six years now, where I've uh, had almost 120, more or less one hour, 45 minute, one hour conversations with 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 people with interesting perspectives, many of whom are the are the 22 people who appear in this book and lots of others besides. And that's that's countercurrent. So if you put in countercurrent, all one word, and kneebone into Google, it will come up. Uh, and that's a free podcast, which I hope people will sample if they're interested. Um, and then I've written quite a lot of articles, which you can find if you just Google uh, kneebone, my surname, on um, on the search engine. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Well, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thank you, David, and thank you, Adam.